Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's just start my timer so we don't overrun. There's lots to get through. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've got two halves to this, this talk. Um, one part about philosophers, one part about babies. So can we just check, uh, show of hands, any philosophers in the room? A few. Well, ha, ha, uh, not quite sure if he's a philosopher, he says. Any babies in the room? Uh, oh, good, there's some babies. Uh, and, yeah, so this talk is basically philosophers versus babies. Who knows more about the meaning of life? Um, I'm, a, I'm a baby psychologist, uh, so this might be slightly biased um, in how it turns out. Um, but, oh, it's just a bit keen there. Uh, there we go. Um, this story starts in 2003, when, for reasons, I had the list of every philosopher in this country. Um, and being a geek of a certain generation, whenever I think about philosophers, I think about life, the universe, and everything. Um, and I think, what is the ultimate answer? Um, and well, we know the ultimate answer, we don't know the ultimate question, but I had a list of every philosopher in the country. So what are you gonna do? Oh, I wrote to them. Uh, I wrote them individually, a letter, um, posted that out to uh, every single philosopher in the country um, and asked them a question. So I asked them, I have it in my head that you might know the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Therefore, I'm writing to ask if you could explain it all to me. Don't be too flattered. I'm writing to every philosopher in the country. Um, so I sent that letter to 644 philosophers. It cost about 250 pounds in postage, um, but you can't put a price on knowledge. Um, and how many replied? Three, zero. I'm waiting for one particular number. There we go. Uh, it, was, uh, it was actually 22 replies, which um, I was... I, I'm wait yeah, it's, it's been 19 years now. I think that's all I'm going to get. Um, and um, yeah, there's one other part of the, the, the letter I asked them. So I asked her, if God were required to explain himself, I'm sure she could do it in a few eloquent paragraphs on one crisply typeset full scrap sheet. Um, though, as an atheist, I've not tried asking her. And you're welcome to go further. So I, I said that they could you know, send me something they'd already written or give me a, a, a short answer. Um, so I'm going to go through all those answers. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. Um, so I'm not going to actually read a lot of them out, but I'm going to classify them for you as to whether they're about life, um, the universe. Um, and it turns out that quite a few of the answers were about God. Um, so we're going to have category of God um, or everything or nothing, perhaps. Um, so the first one came just three days later. Um, and it's from Mark Nelson, who said, a good account of the meaning of life, the universe, and everything could not be contained in one crisply typeset full cap sheet. Bear that in mind. Um, moreover, I think it would end up looking a bit religious. Uh, so one for God. Um, second one, uh, there are lots of reasons why life is valuable and worth living, but there are not many of them very informative ways of collecting them into a single category. And he sent me a reading list. He sent me two books I had to read. Um, I'm not going to try summarizing that either. Uh, so number three, meaning of life. It's every philosopher's nightmare question. Um, and then drawing and Kant and Aristotle and blah, 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 blah. Uh, quite a short, if still, yeah, pretty good attempt. Um, uh, but this is good. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm annoying every philosopher in the country with their, their nightmare question. But hopefully that means that they've got a, a, a prepared answer for it. Um, and then I got number four. <laughs> Andrew Belsey, Cardiff University. I've been keeping tabs on him because uh, the meaning of life is preparation for death. I hope you are well prepared. Now, I don't know about you, that sounds like a death threat to me. Uh, so. Within four days of starting my project, I had a death threat from a philosopher. Um, as I say, it's been 19 years so far. I think I'm in the clear for now. 
Um, so already my categorization system is broken. Uh, I don't know what this category is. Um, we'll just say um, this is uh, um, not about life, it's about death. Um, so that's num number four. Uh, we'll get speed up a bit from here. Um, so uh, Andrew Zuboff sent me a couple of things to read. Uh, an introduction to universalism, uh, which uh, isn't about the universe. Um, and then why should I care about morality? Um, and they, yeah, they, they were quite good. Uh, number six, uh, his letter wasn't very interesting. Uh, uh, it's a nice short thing, though. Respect every good you meet and pursue any good you like. The interesting thing with Tim Chappell is what happened to him three years later, um, when he fell off the side of Ben Nevis. Um, he survived, um, but um, in that moment, his, uh, he had this near-death experience. Um, and being a philosopher, um, he, uh, well, he wasn't actually very well prepared for it, as we'll see in a second, um, but he did write a paper about it. Uh, so he wrote this paper about the fear of death, and I read that, and discovered um, that the main thing that happened to him um, was an incredibly English thing. They just felt slightly embarrassed about the, the trouble that he was causing to his friends um, by going and dying in this way. Um, he then uh, clearly had quite a big effect on him, because a couple of years later he wrote this paper, Infinity Goes Up on Trial, must immortality be meaningless? So he now spends uh, uh, a whole other paper discussing whether he could live forever or not. Um, and you probably can't see that, but the whole first page is actually a quote from Douglas Adams. So it's all an explanation of Wow Bagger, the infinitely prolonged. Um, uh, if my students had given me a quote that was uh, a whole page long, I'm not sure I'd have accepted that. Um, but the Journal of... Oh, I can't see what it is. They didn't seem to mind. Um, so, got a few more. This was... Uh, uh, we don't really know the answer from Harry Lesser. Um, another, another vote for God from John Haldane. And then we get to Michael Rush. So he gives me quite a long letter um, saying that um, it's not a real question in philosophy. Don't you know that? Um, or are you trying to catch philosophers out? Um, and then at the very end, he gets to this, this line, nice line. I think it was Philip of Ho Foot who said that if you were ask a philosopher a question, they talk for a bit, and you go away no longer understanding your question. So there you go. So I think we can, uh, if we can't ask about the meaning of life, uh, and if we buy the claim that there's no purpose, what's left? Well, to quote those well-known kooky funsters, Bill and Ted, be excellent to each other dudes. Aristotle might well have agreed, once we'd agreed upon a suitably uh, Greek translation of dudes. And I think we can all learn a lot from that. Uh, so that was uh, quite a good answer. And that wins my vote for the philosopher that I actually want to go and have a drink with um, and discuss this um, in the pub. How are we doing? Oh, I'm going faster than I expected. Um, so, uh, be excellent to each other. Uh, nice, catchy, simple, simple answer. Can we do any better? Well, n number 10, Derek Parfit, uh, the most famous philosopher on this list, one I had actually heard of, uh, uh, based at Oxford, died, I think, last year. Um, he was the first one that actually um, wrote about the universe. So he sent me a paper um, called Why Anything, Why This? Where he didn't just consider this universe, he considered no universe, uh, every possible universe. Um, and that was, I think, the first one that actually completely blew my mind. Um, it didn't have any useful uh, information about the meaning of life, um, but it was, it was wonderful. He went beyond just a single universe. Um, so thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, another, another couple that were um, about life. Um, and quite a few of these, they, they did send me papers that they'd written elsewhere. Um, and I have read uh, all of the things that uh, people sent me. So another life. Oh, this was great. So i uh, got a paper called Some Astonishing Things from Jonathan Gorman. What a, what a great title um, that was. I got another one with an email. Is um, uh, I think we might have already gone past it, where the, the title of the email... Um, was uh, the meaning of life, and then the, the content of the email was, um, for the meaning of life, see the attachment. Um, 
and the meaning of life was attached. Um, it wasn't a very good uh, meaning of life, though. So. Um, uh, another book recommendation. Uh, I didn't get around to buying that book, so I don't know uh, what the answer... Um, well, it wasn't Michael Proudfoot's answer, you see. It was his friend, so I didn't think it completely counted. Um, this was quite a nice response from uh, Norman Jerris at University of Reading, um, where he just didn't really say about the, the meaning of life. He said he'd, he'd once been to a really great uh, cricket match at, at Old Trafford, um, the sun was shining, had a beer in his hand, and he felt that was lovely. Uh, and that's what his blog post is all about. Um, and that was his sort of nice attempt to, to capture uh, the meaning of life. So what were we up to? 15? Uh, 16? Oh, uh, dear Casper, I am an economist, not a philosopher. But I'm still going to give you the answer. And he did give me quite a long answer. Um, I think I even wrote back to him uh, to thank him. And they sent me an even longer answer after that. Um, I think, yeah, I think I, I, to thank him and apologize that uh, I'd misclassified him. Um, but maybe by now he is a philosopher. We, we've sort of perked, perked up his interest. Um, another one that was uh, quite focused on life on Earth. Um, one more uh, about the universe, um, and uh, yeah, I didn't understand that one, unfortunately. Um, and a nice short one, so let's have this one. Life has no meaning. Individuals can make their life meaning uh, by thinking about uh, the way they would most like to, what they would most like to achieve, then trying to achieve that. Um, and, um, yeah, in the letter, I, I, I told them that uh, I'm sure they're getting uh, letters from cranks all the time and that I was no exception to that. Um, so Mark was quite kind to say, no, at least you were polite in the way that you, you asked us this question. Uh, yeah, so nearly at the end, Fiona McPherson. So this was the very first one. You probably can't see that in there, but she was the very first one to actually quote the Hitchhiker's Guide um, back to me. Um, so, a nice award for her. Um, one more vote for God. Um, and then we get to Dame Nancy Cartwright, uh, professor at the London School of Economics at the time. I think she's at the University of Durham now. Um, she has nearly as many letters after her name as she has in it. Uh, she's got uh, several honorary doctorates, um, all sorts of fellowships. Um, her research is on... Um, what the logical implications of quantum mechanics are for the foundations of logic. Um, so if anybody can answer the question, what is the meaning of life? It is uh, Dame Professor Nancy Carwright. Um, unfortunately, if she does know, um, she's not going to help me. Uh, I have to do my own homework. Um, so there we are. We had um, 22 philosophers, not, 10 of them gave me answers that were to do with uh, life. Uh, two managed to talk about the universe. Uh, several said it's not a real question or they're not going to tell me the answer. Um, three, uh, which is less than I thought, um, said it was God. And then one uh, death threat um, <laughs> as well. So that's, that's, that's pretty good odds for uh, all the philosophers in the country. That is... Um, good answers, and if you want the full set of those answers, um, I was writing a book and it, uh, for NaNoWriMo, where you have to write 50,000 words in a, uh, in a month, and to pad it out, uh, make it a bit longer, I added in all of these answers and did a little commentary on them. Uh, that book is free to download, it's actually copy left as well, so if you want to um, take, take it and change the ending, you can do that. Um, so that's on my website, OneMonkey slash Help Yourself. Um, it's also on Amazon, um, but then uh, a couple of years, actually quite a few years after the book, um, I came across this potentially uh, ultimate answer. So um, this was in H Plus magazine, an, an essay called Cosmic Evolution and the Meaning of Life, and pause for one second. Oh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll um, just put that, I, I need to get something. So.
Um, yeah, so this was um, a different approach to the answer. This actually, um, what John was doing was saying, okay, maybe philosophers don't think there's an answer that's meaningful to the meaning of life. Um, but is evolution itself meaningful? Has it created more meaning in the universe? Certainly, it looks like we're better asking the question, uh, is there a meaning of life, um, than uh, Australopithecus would have been, or the dinosaurs, or you know, sea slugs um, you know, 200 million years ago, trilobites. So it does seem like maybe we're getting better at answering the um, question of the meaning of life. Um, and so perhaps the... Um, answer is to sort of take that bigger cosmic perspective. So maybe we don't have the answer yet, um, but evolution and sort of progress, um, if it is moving towards an answer, it hasn't necessarily stopped. It could carry on. You know, we could um, build something artificial that helps us with this answer. Um, yeah, we could have some uh, machine learning. Uh, it may or may not be intelligent. It, it doesn't matter, but it might help with getting us to this answer. And don't just think about the next 10 years. Don't just think about the next century. Think on a cosmic scale. Think in millions of years' time. And then we don't really know what's coming next. Um, you know, it's impossible to tell what's happening in the next 10 years. So a million years, um, will there be more meaning? There's every chance there would be. In fact, you might even think of it as um, that we're designing a computer so mind-bogglingly complex that we're not, um, not worthy to, uh, um, to calculate its mere operational um, parameters. Um, but the one catch with that is that we mustn't destroy it um, before we get there. Because if we do, then there really is no meaning and no hope of ever knowing um, the meaning. So that, that's the essence of John's essay. Um, I really recommend it. It's lovely. Um, and if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it's don't destroy the world. Um, let's, <laughs> let's maybe make a, a more cheerful version of that to leave the world in a better way than you found it. In fact, let's go and say, um, be excellent to everything. Uh, so not just each other, but everything else as well. Um, but the best thing about John's essay is it's quite short. And um, when I realized this, I like, oh, if I print it really small, I probably can fit it on one crisply typed set, full scrap sheet. So um, bad luck to whichever philosopher said that wasn't true. Um, and I, I hung this in my office. Uh, I've actually uh, had a few email exchanges with John, and we're now pen pals. Um, and um, yeah, there's, um, there's also a few free copies here, a bit larger print if anybody wants to find out um, that at the end. So that is our philosophers. Right, bang on time. Let's change gear now and talk about um, what the baby's answer to this is. So this is Cosmo who is eight weeks old. He already thinks that he's winning at life. Um, I think he is, um, and that is my day job. So my, this is me in my office. Um, I'm a developmental psychologist. I study how babies learn about the world, um, and I've been doing that for 15 or 16 years. Um, and uh, just in 2011, my sister had her second baby there on the, uh, whichever that is, left or right, the little one. <laughs> That's uh, Mirabelle. And um, at the time, my brother um, was learning to become a stand-up comedian. And I had a, a thought that as a family activity, my brother could tell jokes to the baby, um, make the baby laugh, and I could explain with science why the baby was laughing. Um, and this was, seemed like a great idea to me, a different way into the minds of babies, a um, bit more exciting than the way we, we do it in the, in the laboratory. Um, but my brother wasn't interested. Uh, I don't know if you know any stand-up comedians, but they think of themselves as artists, and he basically thought this was too easy. He thought uh, making a baby laugh is not a real test of his talents. 
Um, I mean, he, he, could, he was convinced he could be able to do it, but he just wasn't, wasn't up for this as a, as a project. Um, but the idea stuck in my head as like, wait a minute, you know, babies do laugh a lot. Um, they laugh more than you and I do. Um, and it's so infectious when it happens. And when something's universal and sort of so powerful as that, there's probably something really important behind it. Um, so I then spent the next 10 years uh, researching uh, what makes babies happy and uh, why they're laughing and what that means about their development. Um, I'll give you one example of something we did in that. Um, so I worked with Imogen Heap, who'd just finished writing the music for Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, and we were challenged to write a song, a scientifically designed song that would make babies happy. Uh, so we had lots of babies come into a lab, listen to little snippets of song that Imogen had created, um, and then we picked the, the right bit that she built into a whole song. Uh, here we were launching that song to some of our um, baby uh, music consultants. Um, and when we put it up on YouTube, uh, yeah, it got up to 14 million views of that, that version of the video. Um, if there's time at the end, we may, we may play it for you. Um, so that, that, that's one thing. I've done surveys of parents all over the world, had them send in videos of laughing babies. I uh, can't go through all of that, um, but at the end of it, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote all of that up into a book telling you just that this is, um, the joyfulness is a really important thing of being a baby. Um, uh, also, if you speak German, I think the German edition uh, is funnier than the, the English edition, just judging by the cover. I, I don't speak German myself, but it looks funnier. Um, and if I had to summarize the book in one sentence, uh, it would be a quote from this guy. Don't worry, this is not Nigel Farage. Uh, this is uh, uh, Danish comedian Victor Borg, who says that laughter is the shortest distance between two people. So laughter is something that connects you with another person, and that is so valuable for a baby who doesn't yet speak your language, doesn't yet have any other way to connect. Um, and that does need to connect with other people. So laughter is um, part of the glue and the magic that sort of uh, brings us together in all sorts of forms. Um, and you can see this in the most popular way of making a baby laugh across the whole world. So I surveyed about 1,500 people, had responses from 60, 60 countries, and, and everywhere, tickling and peekaboo were the two things that make babies laugh. And what's going on in Peekaboo is not a surprise. It's really, after the three or first three or four times, even a baby knows uh, what's going on in this game, what's going on in Peekaboo is eye contact. You cannot play Peekaboo while playing on your phone. You cannot play Peekaboo um, while talking to somebody else. To play Peekaboo, you have to make eye contact with that baby. You have to connect with them you have to share your attention um, and your involvement. You basically, you have to have a conversation with that baby. It's a conversation without words. It's a conversation um, that you're equal partners in. And when you do that, the baby appreciates what you're doing. They reward you, keep you going on that. In fact, most baby laughter is an invitation for the person they're laughing with to keep doing what they're doing. Um, the best way to make a baby laugh, other than peekaboo, is just to take them seriously, to stop, pay attention to what they're interested in, um, and when you do, they'll notice and they will be delighted. Um, so that is like this magic trick that babies have to connect with people, to learn from people, because the most complicated thing in the world to learn about is other people. Uh, I'm 48, I still don't understand other people. Um, I'm still learning, and I'm sure I will be learning for my whole life. Um, imagine what it is like for a baby. Yeah. There are so many things I have to understand. The most fascinating, the most interesting um, is people. This is part of the, the way they go about it. Um, and, you know, You'd think about it. it, it ought to be terrifying to be a baby, but they seem happy. What is their secret? What's going on? Um, well, the other, one of the secrets of 
happiness is authentic relationships. It is connecting with other people. And babies, obviously, with, with um, the unconditional love that they get from families, have this. But they also have this disarming quality of um, telling you exactly what they think. Uh, it's great working with babies as psychologists because um, unlike anybody, any adult in a psychology experiment, babies aren't thinking, what do you want me to say? Um, they just say what they, what they think and feel. It might not be in words, um, but it's, it's always honest. And when you interact with a baby, you notice that. You, f you get this feeling that you are getting um, the baby trying to be themselves with you. Um, and so there are the interactions, it's part of the magic of how we interact with babies, um, that you get this from them. Um, so if you want to be happier, improve the quality of your relationships, improving the quality of relationships by being authentic. Um, the other secret to happiness comes from this guy, Michal Chisent Mahali, um, who spent 30 years studying happiness in adults and um, looked at the happiest chefs, the happiest violinists, the happiest athletes, the happiest people who were in prison for um, a life sentence. Um, and in all cases, sort of discovered that the secret to this was getting into a flow state, being able to be very absorbed in something in particular. Um, and um, so it came to this diagram that sort of encapsulates that, that um, when you're at the beginning of anything, it's sort of your level of skill and the level of challenge are, um, are sort of getting you started. Um, but then if maybe you, know, you go a bit too far and you're, you're challenging yourself beyond your skills, that's quite anxious, anxiety provoking. And maybe if things are too easy um, for the skill that you have, that's quite boring. And the, the challenge is always to remain in this, this um, sort of sweet spot where um, your ability and um, the sort of the challenges that you're setting yourself um, match up. Uh, when you do that, um, as uh, his research found across all sorts of walks of life, this is really rewarding. This gets you completely absorbed in what you're doing at any given moment, and you feel a sense of purpose um, and, and, and joy in things. Um, he didn't do any research with babies, but um, initially, um, until someone from Montessori called him up and said, well, this is what our babies do all the day, every day. Um, every day in a baby's life is a new challenge. Every day in a baby's life, um, they are succeeding at something they couldn't do the day before. And they love it. And they are delighted. Um, they have purpose. They have um, this uh, deep satisfaction. Um, they also, I did a bit of research in South, in South America, in Brazil, where we discovered that, um, all right, let's ask you a question. On an average morning, on a scale of uh, 0 to 10, um, how happy do you wake up? Um, so anybody that's sort of below five on a, on a you know, first thing in the morning, uh, how many people above five every, every, every morning? A few. Um, okay, well, babies in this, this survey, all, on average, we're waking up eight out of ten happy and above. Um, this was Brazilian babies. British babies, 7.4 and above. Uh, so Brazilian babies are slightly happier than British babies. Um, but the other one that's a good secret of, a, uh, of happiness is a good night's sleep. Good night's sleep is where you're pr processing all the things that happened the day before. If you're doing new things, if you're absorbing new information, um, Sleep is consolidating that. Your sleep is better. Maybe you wake up happier. Um, one very, very recent part of the secret of the meaning of life just came out just two weeks ago, uh, a month ago in Scientific American, uh, where they discovered that all oh, this sense of purpose is great. This sense of um, uh, of mission is is important. But actually, stopping and enjoying the beauty of the world is also. Um, really, really important to, to feeling that life itself is meaningful. Um, and again, babies could have told you that uh, instantly, just the way they get captivated by um, beautiful things that we, we have overlooked um, is, you know, it's right there in front of us. Um, and then the very last secret of happiness um, comes... Uh, from two and a half thousand years of, of Buddhist philosophy, where they uh, basically 
the whole idea of meditation is not to be emptying your mind and then getting rid of your worries. It's actually to um, uh, avoid that completely and to be sitting with whatever is happening to you, to being present in the moment. All of the meditation training is actually more about being able to concentrate right on the present. Don't worry about and ruminate on the past uh, concerns. Don't worry about your future um, things. Just deal with what's in front of you now. Um, that is the Buddha's secret. That is quite tricky. It takes quite a lot of years of meditation um, to do it as an adult. Um, it's something, again, that babies are little Zen masters. They are present. Um, they are absorbed in what they're doing. Um, so, in terms of like the secret of a good life, I think uh, the babies um, are, are a bit better than these philosophers. And just to summarize that, so, um, yeah, be authentic, be purposeful, be present, you know, pay attention to the present moment, um, belong, connect to other people, um, um, and be joyful, sort of experience and delight in the beauty of the world. Um, it's what babies do. Babies laugh more than you and me. I think they have a secret that we should uh, pay close attention to. So, thank you. I'm just going to show you um, my friend Claire and Les J being excellent to each other. Um, so good, we'll, we'll have to play that again, I think. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.